Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. This is the second instalment of the series Partisans, Irish Stories from the Spanish Civil War, created by myself, Finn Dwyer, and Stuart Redden. The series began last week with the backdrop to the war, its importance and how Spanish politics in the 1930s descended into a spiral of violence that resulted in the outbreak of a civil war in Spain in July 1936. If you haven't heard that episode, it is an important one that sets the stage, so it might be worth checking that out first. In today's podcast, we take a very different tack as we meet our first partisan, a somewhat shadowy, even mysterious figure. Her contemporaries were never quite sure whether Aileen O'Brien was a fascist, a well-meaning yet naive Catholic, or possibly even an arms dealer. However, in this upcoming journey, we are about to follow Aileen O'Brien through her unusual life, and she will help us understand both the international and local influences that drove many Irish people to fight in the Spanish Civil War. She also brings us deep into what was the clandestine world of far-right politics. This includes violent anti-communist protests in Dublin in the 1930s, true to working with the Nazis as they began to dominate Central Europe. Indeed, it was no surprise that the police and eventually even Irish military intelligence, would take an interest into who Aileen O'Brien was and exactly who she was working for. This series is funded by you, the listeners of the podcast. The original research, which utilises numerous archives and includes never-before-published material, involves considerable costs. The Irish History Podcast is completely independent and not supported by any institution or grant. It's based on people like you who have chosen to support this work at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. Listeners who become patrons get early access to ad-free versions of the show, exclusive discussions between me and Stuart about each episode, including material we edited out. You can also get fully referenced episode guides on Patreon as well. That's all available at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. You can also support the show by checking out the new shop at irishhistorypodcast.ie forward slash shop. At the moment, I have a really cool collection of metal and enamel pins of Irish historical figures. These badges start with Brian Baru and include Gráinne Whale, the famous 16th century pirate, and Countess Markovich, the Irish revolutionary. You can get yours today at irishhistorypodcast.ie forward slash shop. Now, let's start the show. Ireland in 1935 was for many a society of shattered dreams. Thirteen years had passed since the War of Independence and the optimism and hope of those days was long forgotten. A brief but bitter civil war was followed by seemingly endless poverty in the 1920s and 30s. Little had ultimately changed in the lives of the poor. Emigration remained extremely high. Indeed, the country was still living under what seemed like the inescapable shadow of the Great Famine of the 1840s. The population had declined every single decade since that terrible event, and by the 1930s, Ireland's population was half what it had been a century earlier. Many returning emigrants found post-independence Ireland disillusioning. The diarist and Catholic priest Alexander McCabe, the rector of the Irish College in Salamanca in Spain, found the country more and more depressing on his occasional visits home. In the 1930s, he confided in his diary, in some places there are new and better built houses, but on the whole houses disappear and the population goes on decreasing. This process of decay is due to emigration, sterility, starvation and disease. He summed up his impressions of Ireland bleakly in the line, There's a dry rot in Irish life, and without any children it seems to be sapless. However, it was in this country, riven with disillusionment, that one wealthy Irish-American couple began what must have been something of a dream come true for them. In 1935, William and Margaret O'Brien, originally from California, had decided to come to Ireland, not for a visit, but instead to relocate their family to the country for what would be a holiday of sorts that would last years. The O'Briens had been separated from their daughters over much of the previous decade. While they had raised their two young sons, William Jr. and Lauren Cheeto, in Chile, the girls had been sent to complete their educations in Switzerland. Now, in 1935, the O'Briens were offered what would be their last chance to live together as a family. Their three daughters had completed their education, and with their eldest, Margaret, already aged 25 and expected to marry soon, the family would be split up permanently. 
So, with the means to do so, William had taken what would be unimaginable for most when he had decided to take a few years off work and the family were reunited in Ireland. Arriving in the spring of 1935, the O'Briens rented the large 15-room Newcastle house outside Enfield, 25 miles west of Dublin. However, for many, their choice of Ireland must have been odd. The weather left a lot to be desired, and given the entire family were native Spanish speakers, they could have moved to Spain. There were other issues as well, however. While William and Margaret were both descended from Irish emigrants, and perhaps desired to spend some time in their ancestral homeland, life in 1930s Ireland was less appealing for younger people. Their three daughters found themselves in a very insular society. Indeed, poverty wasn't the only thing driving people to leave Ireland. Irish society at the time was distinctly authoritarian and monolithic. The power and influence of the Catholic Church over day-to-day -day life was almost total. Any semblance of left-wing or even liberal ideas were stamped out. For example, in 1933, the Leitrim man James Gralton had actually been deported from the country after he clashed with the Catholic Church. Gralton had committed the grave sin of opening an independent dance hall where he ran classes about socialism and organised dances free from church supervision. The greatest Irish writer of the era, James Joyce, who had chosen to live in exile, had left to escape what he called economic and intellectual contradictions that do not allow the development of individuality. However, while this society may seem stifling from a 21st century perspective and it alienated the likes of James Joyce, Many found it alluring, not least among them the three daughters of the O'Brien family. While William and Margaret were conservative in their world view, their three daughters were even more conservative and more right-wing than their parents, a phenomenon not uncommon among many middle and upper-class children of that generation. While the three sisters appear to have had deep convictions, however, it was Aileen, the second eldest daughter, who was far and away the most political member of the family. When she arrived in Ireland in 1935, Aileen held pretty extreme political views, even in the context of what was already an extreme age. An ultra-Catholic, she actually believed Ireland was not conservative nor indeed right-wing enough. She feared it was in fact at risk of sliding towards communism. Indeed, while she travelled to Ireland to be reunited with her parents, Aileen also had ulterior motives. While in Ireland she was working for a shadowy organisation intent on eliminating communism and pushing Ireland and many countries across Europe to the right. Her arrival in Ireland would start a journey for Aileen where she travelled around the country organising meetings but it ultimately led her and indeed many Irish people to battlefields in Spain. When the O'Briens arrived in Ireland Aileen was by no means the most striking member of the family. She didn't really stand out. She was a middle child, the second eldest of five, while her physical appearance was not striking either. Standing at just five feet tall, she was frequently criticised for how she looked. One Irish cleric dismissed her disparagingly as ordinary enough and having a pale, watery face as if she were anemic. However, these were the views of a priest focused on her gender and her physical looks. It would in fact take a nun to see Aileen for what she was. At a reception in Madrid some years later, this nun would point out Aileen across a crowded room, describing her as a very intelligent but very dangerous woman. Indeed, by the time she arrived in Ireland, Aileen was no mere slip of a girl, as one bishop would call her. This so-called girl was at the end of a journey that had seen a demure Catholic child transformed into a hardened, far-right activist. This was a journey that spoke to the experiences of so many who would go on to fight for fascism in Spain. Born in California in 1913, Aileen O'Brien had led something of a transient life. While she and her two sisters Margaret and Barbara had been born in the USA, the family had moved to Antofagasta in Chile before the birth of her brothers in the early 1920s. Aileen spent much of her childhood in Chile where she became a fluent Spanish speaker, something that would be crucial in years to come. However, in her early teenage years, she was on the move again when her parents sent her to Switzerland to complete her education in the later 1920s. She first attended a finishing school and then university in the city of Freiburg. However, it was the political climate of Europe in the late 1920s and early 1930s that shaped Aileen's life far more than her education. In 1929, a stock market crash led to a global recession which plunged economies off a cliff edge across the world. 
The working class, forced into grinding poverty and near starvation, gravitated towards various socialist and communist parties. People from middle and upper class families, like Aileen, tended to gravitate towards the right. From Switzerland, she watched this process transform Germany just across the border from Freiburg. Hitler emerged as a major force in the 1930 general election before taking power in 1933. His Nazis were just one of a string of fascist movements enjoying success at that time. Mussolini had already established a dictatorship in Italy. The fascist Falange would soon emerge in Spain, while Ono Duffy, a former general in the Irish army, established the Blue Shirts, a 30,000 strong militia along similar lines in Ireland. For Aileen, these movements emerging across Europe in the early 1930s were a bulwark against what she saw as the rising threat posed by communism and socialism. Among conservative families like hers, no matter where they lived, be it Ireland, Switzerland or the USA, a fear of communism tended to be central to their world view. It was not just the redistribution of wealth that they despised, but communists were also perceived as a personal threat as well. Aileen had come of age in the immediate aftermath of the Russian communist revolution, where thousands of middle and upper class people had been killed. Indeed, in Switzerland, she had even met conservative Russian exiles who had fled after the revolution and brought stories of massacres with them. These were all formative experiences in her political journey, but ones shared to some degree or another by people in Ireland, Spain and further afield. By the early 1930s, Aileen's views had developed in line with those of the far right in Europe. Obviously central to her worldview was that violent hatred of communism. Although she disagreed with the Nazis when it came to issues of religion, she was impressed by Hitler's campaign against what she called the Red Menace. That this had seen thousands of socialists and communists executed did not seem to concern her. In terms of the economy, she criticised both the left and the right, saying she opposed the dualism of big capitalism and the state ownership of communism, a view common to European fascists. She also believed in a patriarchal worldview, believing a woman's place was in the home to look after men. Indeed, she found Irish women disappointing, saying on one occasion, Irish women are sadly lacking in those feminine arts which spell the difference between misery and comfort in the home of the worker. In 1934, Aileen finally found her political home in a new organisation called the Pro Deo Commission. The Pro Deo Commission, which literally means for God, sought to unify members of the Catholic, Protestant and Russian Orthodox faiths in a combined effort to combat atheism. However, it also had political dimensions. It was in fact a creation of the far right. Its founders had been united around the slogan of order, family, property and nationality a catch cry of the European right at the time. Indeed, the Nazis were among the backers of this Pro Deo Commission, and it was violently anti-communist, while many of its members were also anti-Semitic. It was also suspected of having far more nefarious aims as well, as we shall see. When Aileen arrived in Ireland, she believed Irish society, as we have seen, was not conservative or right-wing enough. She soon launched a campaign on behalf of the Pro Deo Commission committed to rooting out communism and the threat of atheism wherever she found it. This would see her spending much of 1935 and 1936 travelling across Ireland, giving impassioned, provocative and often inflammatory speeches, increasing anti-communist sentiment in the country. While this would have major consequences at the outbreak of the Spanish Civil War when the fascists would present their cause as a crusade against communism, in 1935, in Ireland, it surely seemed like an utterly bizarre waste of time. Indeed, in some minds, it was even somewhat suspicious. Ireland was, after all, arguably one of the most devout and conservative places in Europe. As we shall see next, there was no risk of communism or atheism, which begged the question why Aileen devoted so much time and energy to fighting it. When Aileen arrived in Ireland, the reality was that the country was fervently anti-communist and one of the most religious societies in Europe. Indeed, the position of the Catholic Church in the 1930s was unassailable. Its strength and influence had been illustrated when the Eucharistic Congress and International Gathering of Catholics had been held in Ireland in 1932. Staged every few years, Ireland had been chosen that year to mark what was supposedly the 1500th anniversary of the arrival of St. Patrick to the island. The response of Ireland's Catholics was remarkable. 
Around one million people had attended a mass in Dublin, an extraordinary figure given the total population of the entire island stood at around four million. With such a powerful Catholic church, communism, Aileen's other target, stood little chance. Indeed, in the early 1930s, the hierarchy of the Catholic Church had already essentially declared war on Ireland's tiny communist movement. They issued a pastoral letter warning Irish Catholics, you cannot be a Catholic and a communist. One stands for Christ, the other for the Antichrist. This was followed by increasingly inflammatory sermons and in 1933, priests in Dublin began to urge violent attacks against communists in the city. One priest urged the faithful to take the law into your own hands, while another told his flock to directly attack communists. This led to violent mobs hunting communists in the streets of Dublin, and after one particular sermon in the pro-cathedral, around 5,000 people marched on Connolly House, the headquarters of the Irish Communist Party. The handful of activists inside fought back the mob and even fired shots to disperse them. This was all to no avail, and the crowd burned down the building. A police report on these events illustrated the weakness of Ireland's communist movement. The report read, It is clear that this movement against communism is very strong in Dublin, and elaborate police arrangements will require to be made to prevent the destruction of premises used by the Communist Party. Yet, despite all this, Aileen O'Brien still believed the Communist Party, which was being driven from the streets of Dublin, posed a threat, and in March 1935, having moved to Ireland to spend time with her family, she began what was a year of ceaseless activism against it. In what would become a national tour that lasted well over 12 months, she brought anti-communism in Ireland to new levels, as the events that led to the Spanish Civil War began to unfold. Aileen began her tour in the town of Dundalk, not far from where her family were based in Enfield, in what was a well-attended event. However, it was a few weeks later, when she travelled to Cork, that Aileen displayed the organisational skills and experience she had presumably learned in Switzerland, and indicated that this tour would make an impact in Irish society. She took time to organise press coverage in advance, resulting in Aileen and the Pro Deo Commission being commended by the Cork Examiner. Indeed, they even carried a letter from Aileen in the article reporting on her visit. While she lectured crowds on the dangers of communism, she also displayed numerous images to reinforce the message. These included graphic pictures of victims of religious persecution in the communist Soviet Union, along with blasphemic images and cartoons taken from communist publications. Minor controversy around these images only served to generate further press attention and undoubtedly provoked curiosity. Through the following months, she, and on occasion her sister Barbara, toured all major towns and cities in Ireland, including Armagh, Waterford, Galway, Drogheda, Carlow, Kilkenny, Killarney and Belfast. What marked the exhibition out was the preparatory work. Local newspapers always interviewed Aileen. She was also frequently welcomed by clerics and in some cases bishops and local politicians. This was in no small part aided by an identity she had forged for herself that at times had only a passing resemblance to the truth. For example, she claimed she had travelled extensively, including inside the Soviet Union, and some journalists seemed to have been under the impression she had actually been imprisoned there, all of which was completely false. By November of 1935, it was claimed that 50,000 people had already attended her events, a figure that may well have been accurate. According to some reports, 20,000 people had visited her talks and the exhibition in Cork City alone. The success of her rallies reflected the deep anti-communist sentiments in Irish society, and now Aileen was stoking this by heightening fears. The rhetoric in her meetings verged on the alarmist, building on what was already a pretty violent atmosphere. For example, in a meeting in Carlo, it was claimed that there was an agent of the Third International a Soviet-controlled international organisation that advocated communism, in every county in Ireland. These agents were supposedly working for the gradual introduction of communism across the country. This was, it goes without saying, ridiculous. The notion there was agents of the Third International to be found wandering around rural Carlow who were secretly about to introduce communism was laughable. Those that did exist were marginalised figures with very little influence. Nevertheless, Aileen fed on the fears of Irish people. However, in 1935, what she or any Irish person was supposed to do with the building hatred towards communism was unclear. There were continued attacks on communists in Ireland, 
But for most people living outside Dublin or Cork, even finding a communist would have been difficult. However, in the summer of 1936, events in Spain would finally provide an outlet for the pent-up fury and anger building in Ireland against communists. In the winter of 1935-36, to Aileen travelled to Switzerland to report to the Pro Deo Commission on her work in Ireland. She returned by way of Nazi Germany, travelling extensively through the Third Reich. The fact that she met with Gertrude schulz klink the leader of the National Socialist Women's League and one of the most powerful women in Nazi Germany, was indicative of her growing stature not only in Ireland but among the far right in Europe. This would become increasingly important in the coming months and years as the civil war in Spain would link fascists across the world. Indeed, Aileen returned to Ireland just around the time of the fateful Spanish elections of February 1936, which, as we heard last week, set Spanish politics on the road to war. The electoral victory of the left-wing Popular Front also put Spanish politics in the headlines in Ireland, with the press scrutinising what the new left-wing government would do. Unsurprisingly, in a country where society was extremely conservative, the mainstream press lamented the victory of the left-wing Popular Front, calling it the Red Regime. Indeed, the coverage was hysterical in some quarters, with the Irish Independent claiming the Popular Front had released lepers from a leper colony. Through March, widespread attention was also given to the growing protests against the Catholic Church in Spain. Some had turned violent and churches had been burned. This outraged many in Ireland, who could not grasp why people would attack a chapel. There was no understanding that in Spain the Catholic Church was inextricably linked to class tension and viewed by many as an elitist institution and the preserve of the rich and powerful. Indeed, in some respects, these attacks were good news for Aileen. They did, after all, seem to confirm everything she had claimed about the dangers posed by communists and socialists. However, while events in Spain were heating up, tension around Aileen herself was also brewing in Ireland. In early 1936, she came under scrutiny for the first time. Since her arrival in Ireland a year previously, she had received almost universal praise in the press. No one had ever stopped to ask the key question of who she was working for. No one really knew very much about this mysterious Pro Deo Commission, which was based in Switzerland, aside from what Aileen had told them. Finally, however, in early 1936, Ireland's small but committed communist movement began to question the motives of the group. Articles began appearing in the communist Workers' Voice newspaper attacking Aileen. One in particular indicated Irish communists may have used their international connections in other communist parties to investigate who precisely Aileen was, because they carried very detailed and pretty explosive claims about her. The workers' voice claimed that the Pro Deo Commission was in fact funded by the Vickers and Armstrong Weapons Company in a campaign orchestrated by leading members of the Tory or Conservative Party in England. The purpose, the communists claimed, was to get Catholics to fund weapons purchases for anti-communists overseas, a move which would in turn make money for the arms companies. While this was a bizarre claim, to say the least, six months later the Irish police developed a similar assessment of Aileen, claiming she was working for Messrs Vickers and Armstrong for the past few years and her occupation is to foment hostility towards communism and transact sales for arms to countries menaced by communists. Where this information was sourced is unclear and we will ultimately never know for certain if Aileen was indeed being funded by an arms company. However, her actions in the summer of 1936 and beyond did little to contradict this idea. In that summer of 1936, Spanish politics, as we heard in the last episode, approached boiling point and on July 17th the Spanish generals staged their coup d'etat to depose the left-wing government elected the previous February. These generals were framing their rebellion as a crusade against Spain's atheistic left-wingers. This, in many ways, was the perfect war for Aileen. In many respects, she had preached about such a conflict for over a year in Ireland. While the war was about far more than just Catholicism, not least fascism and democracy, the reality was the hysterical, anti-communist attitude in Ireland she had helped create saw many Irish Catholics happy to ally with fascism in such a war. The Irish parliamentarian Patrick Belton gave voice to this when he said, If it's necessary to be a fascist to defend Christianity, then I am a fascist. Once the coup was launched, Aileen began to plan how best she could help the Spanish fascists. 
Her actions would do little to dispel the notion she was working for an arms company. In the late summer of 1936, as we'll see in coming episodes, she would milk the paranoid anti-communist environment she had helped foment for every penny, gun and soldier to fight for fascism in Spain. While Alien's story has brought us up to the eve of Irish involvement in the Spanish Civil War, her understanding of the world, and indeed the Spanish Civil War, was a highly partisan one. While her views were similar to those of a majority of Irish people, there was a very important minority who had very different views. For them, the war in Spain was about fascism and democracy, and were willing to fight against fascism. Before we can move the series to Spain, we need to look at one of these people. So next week, we'll stay in Ireland and meet the second partisan, the Dublin communist Bob Doyle. Born in 1916, Bob was three years younger than Aileen and grew up in the same turbulent world, but his working class background led him to very different conclusions about life and politics. Finally, don't forget to check out those badges at irishhistorypodcast.ie forward slash shop. Until next time, Sloan. Sloan.